Today's broadcast is brought to you by Kidum. Kidum is a standards-based platform helping teachers personalize learning. With Kidum, teachers can gain access to an unlimited library of content with beautiful, actionable reports. And the best part is, Kidum is free. Visit them today over at kidum.co to learn more. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is September the 20th, and there are so many new things happening in the world of Google Apps for Education. And today we're going to be discussing all the biggies, starting with some of the important things that are happening in Google Docs, Google Drive, and, of course, Google Classroom. I want to bring group today. I want to bring on Miss Jennifer Judkins. Jen, how are you today? How are things in your Google land? Excellent. A little busy prepping for our first ed camp in my high school Excellent. on Saturday. And what's the ed camp called? Ed Camp North Shore. <laughs> wow. And uh, you're having a big event. How can we find out more about this event? So there's a website, edcampnorthshore.org, and it's um, happening in Linfield, Massachusetts on Saturday at 8 a.m. So we're expecting about 150 to 200 teachers. And one assumes that if you're in Massachusetts, you can easily be reached by, let's see, New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, Boston, New York, um, Arizona, anything like that, we can certainly come out and do that ed camp for. Check that out. Jen, one more time, what was that ep- that website? edcampnorthshore.org. Excellent. And from one ed camp North Shore to another, Sam Patterson, how are you today? Great. Excellent. Sam, tell us a little bit about what's going on there out in your world. How is your uh, your Makerspace uh, airplane hangar doing? My Makerspace airplane hangar is doing quite well. We have we're, we finally have all of our tech in line. We've got kids making movies, documenting processes. Uh, they finished Marble Run Machines today and actually put it through two different iterations with playtesting. Um And yesterday, I even had my teachers making at a faculty meeting. It was awesome. Now, you're also doing a podcast of your own. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Beyond the Hour of Code is an amazing little podcast that uh, we keep pumping out episodes of, currently working through our summer backlog. Uh, In the the shoot on that one, we have uh, Nathan Stevens. He's going to, his episode will be coming out this week. Excellent. I want to bring on Josh. Josh, how are you doing today? Welcome back to the show. Things are doing super awesome here. Uh, planning our makerspace stuff as well. Kicking off our orientations tomorrow for our fifth and seventh grade students. What are you doing in your makerspace? Uh, well, we're still trying to figure that out. But as a, a general idea, we have uh, some makey makeys. We have some raspberry pies. Uh, we have some different games that students can play like Kerbal Space Program and uh, Kodu. So a lot of variety in there, little bits. We have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and uh, hoping to develop some leadership in in our second year with our makerspaces. So it'll be a fun adventure this year. Nice. Looking forward to doing some makerspace shows here as we uh, progress through our school year. Want to invite our brand new co-host on. She is a fantastic technology coach. I think that's still the right term for you from the great state of Connecticut, Miss Alexia. How are you today, Alexa? I am good. Thanks for having me. And the new title is Tech Integrator, but same thing. Fantastic. Just different name. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where can we find you? So I am a high school tech integrator at uh, New Canaan High School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, And this is my first year there, but I have been in the field for a while. And we are uh, at New Canaan High, knee deep in a uh, 9 through 12 BYOD rollout and uh, just navigating the new Connecticut uh, data privacy laws that are going to be uh, implemented on October 1st. So lots of changes that are going on for us. There certainly is a lot of neat stuff going on out there. And if there is anything that you would like to talk about on the show, you can, of course, reach out to us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voice message over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And, of course, we love it when you subscribe to this show and all of our channels over on TeacherCast.net slash audio and TeacherCast.net slash video. And once again, welcome back to our show. We are live here on Tuesday nights on TeacherCast.tv at 8 o'clock p.m. 
uh, Eastern Standard Time. There is an awful lot of stuff going on here on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network. The big thing is that we are going to be traveling this weekend out to beautiful Seattle, where we're going to be covering the Hack the Classroom event uh, sponsored by our friends over at Microsoft Education. It is a two-hour event happening this Saturday from 8 to 10 Pacific Time. And uh, if you have a chance, it is a free registration. You can certainly go over to teachercast.net slash hack of the classroom. Register for free. Check it out. We have a great amount of keynote speakers. They are going to be doing, by the way, guys, a live makerspace with fantastic events. And uh, yours truly is going to be there in the background doing all the interviews and Snapchatting and Facebook living and, and basically covering everything from all the social media. So check that out. We're going to be following the hashtag hack the classroom. And again, that's going to be happening this Sunday, September 24th. In just a few days, I am extremely excited about it. And the other thing I'm extremely excited about is that today on 920, they have a lot of brand new updates to our Google Apps for Education. Has anybody seen some of the new things that have been coming out, guys? I'm totally new to it. I didn't even check anything during the day. My Tuesdays are so slammed. What do we got? Well, one of the things... uh, Go ahead. Ahead, now I was going to say one one of the new things that I mean, that I've been seeing hitting all the Twitters is something new about Google Docs and and a new feature there. Josh, did you happen to see that new feature in Google Docs? I did. Uh, I'm part of the Northeast Wisconsin Google Educator Group, which there's probably one in your area, and I'd suggest being a part of it. And we have some awesome leadership there. Ben Hummerding is uh, local in the area, and he is pretty good at posting in there so whenever something is new he's got it so like i found out right away i got the notification on my phone uh so google docs even though i was just kind of poking fun at myself and other people who freak out over stuff like this uh, google docs now has columns which is exciting i mean it's something that they probably should have had a long time ago but they now have it and so instead of having to do that goofy uh hidden border table workaround you now have native columns in Google Docs. So that's pretty exciting. That is a pretty neat feature. I know as a, as a tech coach here, that is a feature that people have been asking for. Uh, where can we find that? Has anybody figured out where in Google Docs we can find that, uh, that columns feature? Uh, it is under the format menu. So you can go under format. Uh, there is a columns uh, kind of side menu option where you can go in and, and choose uh, whether you want two or three columns. And then there's actually a few more options where you can choose some of the spacing and whether or not you want lines between the columns. Um, so that's that's about it for right now. Not a ton of customization, but it's there. And another feature that I'm seeing come out today is something about search. Um, has anybody picked up on that? Have they updated the search features in uh, some of these apps? I believe the well, answer they're looking for is yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> they, they have. I was waiting to see if somebody else is going to jump in. So, yeah, they updated the Google Drive searched, search to act a little more like a Google search does uh, because it used to be where if you search in Drive and you misspelled something, it wouldn't pull it up. Like it wouldn't guess that you might have meant this other thing. It was very literal in the search. So now it, they have uh, what they call it natural language processing. And so you can search for things like, you know, bring up spreadsheets from December and uh, it'll actually give you a little suggestion after you type that in, like, do you want to search file type spreadsheets from, and then the dates, it was pretty neat. I tried it out earlier today and it was uh, pretty spot on with my like rambling sentence. And I guess the reason why they're moving to that is because Google is really trying to get us past the typing and they're really doing a lot more with, with voice search. So I, I guess they're trying to make all their programs, you know, really, really react to the way that we're speaking to it these days. Uh, Jen, do you find a lot of people in your district are are learning these skills of search or are they just randomly putting in words or how, how do you handle teaching search in your district? So I've kind of in terms of teaching search for the web versus teaching search within the Google tools, when we're teaching search in the web, we're typically doing that as part of a lesson that's involving research of some topic. And we try to focus at the early grades on having kids 
have to submit their proposed keywords that they're searching so that the teacher can have a quick conversation before the kids actually go to a computer and enter those search terms. Um, one of the tools that I like to use that helps visually for kids to see the effectiveness of certain search terms is Instagrock. And Instagrock is a um, search engine that's visual. So it's kind of a nice like pre-Google search engine for kids to use where they type in their word and it, it appears in the center of the screen with, um, with the related terms um, off on, you know, in separate um, bubbles as a graphic organizer kind of, um, you know, arrangement. And then kids can click on any of those related bubbles and it will explode those words so they can see related terms that way. So we try to have whole class discussions about when it's a topic with younger students and as they get older, we try to show them some of the advanced search options so that they can refine their search even better. Now, Sam, you've been working with the younger kids uh, in, in this position and in your past positions. Do you have any advice on teaching just basic search or search terminologies? It, you know, it's challenging because essentially the more they know about what they're trying to search, the easier it is to create something like, you know, for them to actually search the right thing. But I think the, the most important things we can do are like tools like this can be really helpful, but really going in ahead of time and running what seem to be the logical searches in there and seeing what pops in is always important. And just making sure like I haven't looked recently at the Google search iPad app. But I remember from two years ago that the safe search controls on that were like four layers down. And that was challenging for me because since they weren't on the surface, I didn't see them until I should have seen them earlier. Hmm. I, I didn't know that, uh, that it was that far down with things. Uh, Alexa, is that something that you bring up with, with your position? Do you get into safe search and parent controls or do you keep things open? I know you were talking about... Uh, you know, uh, child safety laws and stuff that are coming in here. What do you think about all this? It, it, it we, we do keep things open. Um, and it's, you know, talking about the idea of searching, um, one of the things that really stuck out to me um, at ISTE in 2015, um, I remember sitting in one of Alan November's uh, lectures about talking about the importance of teaching kids how to, how to query and um, the importance of asking the right questions because so often if you um, are talking about, let's say the, um, I don't know, the, um, I, I'm trying to think of, let's think of any topic, the, um, the War of 1812. If you ask kids what happened during the War of 1812, they're going to type in the question into Google, what happened during the War of 1812. We need to uh, teach them how to ask the right questions, how to research the right questions. And it's up to us as the teachers to kind of form that query because otherwise they don't know what questions to search for. And that's where the idea of something like the, um, the, the Chrome extension, Google similar pages can come into play where you, you don't always know as the teacher what it is that you necessarily want to look for. So when you are forming that query, for your students, you can get some similar ideas using something like Google Similar Pages, where you want your student. And that's usually geared towards education. So if you are on something like the, the Smithsonian's website, uh, that wouldn't necessarily fit for the War of 1812, but you know where, where I'm going with that, that would lead you towards something else that might be geared towards your students that could lead them in the right direction. And that's, we don't want to send them on a wild goose chase, but we want to have them going in the right direction for something that's going to make sense for their research. And so that's where we start our show. We're going to be talking about all these new things that are going to be happening and popping out. And one of our favorite apps, actually, is Google Classroom. And I don't know if you guys caught this, but uh, the last couple of days we've been running a Twitter poll on, uh, on TeacherCast. And we did a simple Twitter poll that says, what's your favorite Google app? And I think we gave, you know, they only give you four choices on Twitter. So we did Classroom, Sites, Slides, and Forms. And I don't want to give it away, but Classroom is in the lead by a lot. And we 
talked about Google Classroom in the early August of some of the new features. And, you know, we've been in school for about a month now, gone through it. And I, I kind of want to stop and take a look at some of the new features and not only what are they, but how have we been seeing them used in our classrooms? Are they good? Are they bad? Should we be changing them? Should we be keeping them? What do you think about them? So we're kind of going to do a round robin show today. And again, we are live on TeacherCast.tv, and I love our audience here. I want to say hello to Paula and Charlie and Peg and Jeff and Sam and Josh. Thank you guys for joining us tonight, and uh, please bring your comments in here. Um, we want to hear from you. The first feature of Google Classroom that I want to bring up is something I haven't seen a lot of teachers using, which is tagging assignments. Um, first of all, Josh, what is tagging assignments? What does that mean and how can that be used in the classroom? Well, if you think back to blogging, if you're more familiar with that, or even Twitter, uh, you can hashtag something and you can click on the hashtag and only see tweets that have that. Well, essentially, Google Classroom has incorporated that functionality where you can assign one and just one topic to an assignment or an announcement or any other post and then you can filter your stream by one topic so if it's maybe if it's quizzes or you know reading assignments uh, you can have a tag for that and so if they want to see just those things they just click on that tag on the left and they'll see like a bank of them and then that's all that will show in the stream so that's kind of the, the long and the short of it. Alexa, have you seen this feature being used in, in with your teachers? Do they even know that it exists? So it's several teachers have asked me about it. They've seen that it, it's an option there. But on, honestly, I haven't really seen anybody using it. Um, they have said, oh, that's something where I could tag that as a biology homework or something along those lines. But I haven't seen anybody putting that into, into use yet. Interesting. Sam, how about you? Are you doing anything with that as far as teachers goes? It sounds like witchcraft. <laughs> no, um, I, I haven't yet. I'm just starting using Google Classroom. And so far, there's a lot I really like about it. And I imagine as I start building kind of a catalog of things I've done in Google Classroom, the tagging of assignments could be really helpful, especially if I were to use tagging that focused on like when we like if I did it on skills, so like sewing or construction or something like that, then it would allow me to maybe see in would I be able to see multiple classes tag like do the tags go across classes? That would be useful. If you are putting an assignment in, I believe you can tag the one assignment and then drop down to multiple classes. So I, I think you could. Am I right about that, guys? I think so. Okay. Um, again, I haven't played right. with it too when much. I, imagine I think that's how, the idea with it. Imagine how this might be useful to me. That comes in. Um, but like I run a lot of, you know, I run seven different grade levels of classes once or twice a week, depending on the grade level. So it's a lot of very different things that I have to keep organized. I know that that would be really useful if I had a lot of the same things. So I'm not sure. Well, I'll ask you this. Are you a labeler in your Gmail inbox? I was at one point, but I, I didn't find it rewarding enough to keep up with. I have a lot of labels, but I haven't actually applied one in forever. Same here. So I set them up like I was going to do it but never actually right. went through with doing it. And that's what I would imagine the tagging feature would be like in Classroom. And I find I rarely spend time thinking, if I had only applied a label right now, my life would be better. But that's just me. But I could see how it would be very helpful for people who live and die by those, by those labels. Definitely. And, you know, I think that we really need as many organizational tools as possible because so many people have so many different styles. I'm excited about the improved search because I really hope that's going to help my relationship with Google Drive because I'm not a consistent namer. So if it can, you know, do a little thinking for me and maybe guess what I might have been thinking at the moment, I'm all for it. Yeah. 
So one of the other features that we have in here as far as the new Google Classroom features is parent communication. Um, this is definitely a hot topic. Everybody wants to know how to get parents involved in Google Classroom. And, you know, we've kind of talked about this over the last few days here is 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 Google Classroom supposed to be for parents? I know they they've added features, but what do you guys think? Alexa, is is this is this something that we need? Do we need parents in there or is Google saying no to any other adult because you can't really differentiate between parent, stranger, and anybody else. So this has been this has been a hot topic um, in my district, and this is I think a wonderful way. The the it's been called the parent portal. I think they're calling it the um, let me see the uh, the guardian email summaries is what they're what they're calling it. Um, I think this is a really smart way. For, um, for Google Classroom to get parents in there without getting them in there. Um, it's still a closed classroom. Um, it's still just for the students and the teacher. Um, but what this is, these parent um, email summaries are doing is allowing parents to get, um, for, so the teacher can go into the student section and enter in the guardian emails um, just one time and they, this will allow the parents to choose a week or daily or weekly summary of all of the students' classes. So let's say that Johnny has um, Mrs. Schlechter for English and Mr. Smith for math and Mr. Jones for um, science in the Google Classroom. A big um, argument that um, we've had about Google Classroom is that it's completely closed off for parents. The parents have no idea what's happening in there and they're not privy to what the assignments are or what's due or what's missing. And that was, how are they supposed to know and keep up with, with their students? The flip side of it is that the students should be responsible enough to, to get the work done on their own. I think this is a really great balance of keeping the parents in the loop without um, and still putting the onus on the students to actually have to get the work done on their own. So I, uh, there has been some um, definite blips. Uh, those of you who, the Google certified trainers, uh, the talk of the town in our uh, trainer forum that there's been some problems with non Gmail accounts, but it looks like Google is on that and um, aware of the problem and I think everything is is close to being rectified. Jen, you and I have talked about this a lot. What do you think about parent interaction? And and is it easy for teachers to be adding parents in bulk? So I think a lot of us were disappointed at first to see that the Guardian feature required manual adding of email addresses. I think when you're a teacher with a class of 15 to 20 students, that's doable. But if you're a teacher with 100 plus students, which is pretty typical in a middle and high school classroom, then it becomes a, a real chore and an unrealistic thing for teachers to do. Um, one of the things that we have learned just recently um, is that once a, once a guardian's email is added to a student, regardless of the classroom that that's added to, that guardian email is uh, is then available for all classes. So in other words, if I'm a parent, my kid has seven classes, one of those teachers has added my email, then I will get provided the other teachers have that parent guardian email um, switch flipped on, even if they didn't, didn't manually enter my parent email addresses in their classrooms, I will get a summary for all of the classes, not just the class for which my email was entered manually. So that's a good thing to know. And that's gonna travel with students as they age. So as we do this at our lower grades where it's more practical, where they have fewer students, um, provided the parent emails stay the same, then those won't need to be updated year to year. Because what I think is important to note is that they're really not getting access to a specific class. The parents are getting a summary for classroom, the actual platform. So regardless of the classes as they change year to year, the, the updates will continue. So I think that makes it a little bit more, um, you know, doable for a lot of teachers. But then we've also talked in our district about some other alternatives for notifying parents beyond just using the parent notification. 
And I think that's where some of the errors were coming into play, Jen, is that um, some of the parents were getting back that, uh, or teachers were getting back an invalid invitation notification, and that was because the parent had already been added um, by another teacher. So they were thinking that the system was flawed in some way or that the email was flawed, and that was because they had already been added and they were already in the system, so it was an invalid invitation. But that was what um, I think they are trying to do away with that, with that error message. It doesn't mean that the parent is not entered. Um, so that is, if you happen to get that message, please proceed and know that the, the, <laughs> that the that the summary should go through. Um, at least that's what I'm what I'm gleaning. What they may have done, Alexa, to to rectify that is, um, I had a teacher come to me today and say, "I'm totally confused. I didn't enter parent emails, and suddenly I went into classroom today, and they were all there, or a lot of them were there." So I think to avoid that situation, it somehow is pushing through to all of the classrooms for which it has been entered so so teachers would know who is and is not already on that list so hopefully that will solve that so let's say this one more time because we just had a little bit of an audio glitch here had some had a, a little hiccup here in the studio if a parent signs up for google classroom that parent email is connected to the student or the parent email is connected to the particular class the parent email is connected to the student and not even just for this single school year, but forever. So no matter where so, that student goes, that parent will follow in all of the classrooms. So if a parent has district. so if yeah. a parent has two kids, they still have to put it in twice and attach it to two children. Exactly. Because so, it's associated with the student account. So as the student enrolls in more classes or as the student um leaves classes at the end of a year and, and picks up a new course load, they'll always have that email on file and provided it doesn't change the parent would, and, and, and also provided the teacher has the um, email access for guardians, that guardian notification feature flipped on, which is something they have to do in their stream, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the student area of classroom. So the teachers do have to enable that. How, yes. does, how, how does a teacher, change a parent's email or does that have to be done through admin so the teachers do it no, manually so, oh go ahead so i'm sorry go ahead jen i was it's the parent does not enter anything in jeff the teacher has to enter everything in manually through the student section um the student section of google classroom but the um, but the teacher can change toggle. the teacher can change the parent's email if needed Mm -hmm. Exactly. How and many that would push it out to all the classes? How many people can be attached to one student? Can you have mom, dad, grandma, uncle? Uh, you know, you the... can actually. And one of the things that we just thought about today was, gee, you know, this would be a great way to keep special educators in the loop who have that particular student on their caseload. So we've often struggled with what's the best way to get updates, weekly updates, to special educators that are supporting students. And, and this provides a potential option for that. Um, you know what? One, I know yeah. of a great website that has an amazing amount of cheat sheets. I wonder if there's a cheat sheet for this on that website. Jen? <laughs> yes, I have a Google Classroom cheat sheet on my site, teachingforward.net. And I did um, update the screenshots to include the new parent notification feature. Fantastic. Um, there's so much more to talk about here. Um, one of the other things that I was finding out recently is teachers might want to create assignments in things other than a turn inable document or a turn inable Google slides or something. Jen, you and I were talking about this earlier. What happens if a teacher wants to do a Google form quiz? Can students still turn that in even though there's no turn in button? So with a form, for example, there's not a turn in button because their submission is the result of them submitting the form. So that's how they complete their work. But for that, as well as even an assignment as simple as a teacher posting read pages 20 to 24 tonight, um, we encourage our teachers to use Google Classroom to post all of their homework. So it's clear to students that their digital version of homework or their reminder is always in the same place. And so in, in instances where the kids are not actually turning anything in, then what we 
um, show students to do is that there is a choice that is uh, shown on assignments that don't have a turn in option called mark as done. And the mark as done button will take it off the students to do list and it will help students to, you know, just kind of handle it as a checklist like, okay, I did that assignment, I can move on to the next one. It doesn't affect anything on the teacher side except for um, just notifying the teacher on the list as it's counting down or, or I'm sorry, counting up how many students have, have done their work versus how many students uh, work, pieces of work are undone, um, then it, it affects that measure. So it's just a good habit for kids to get into to mark as done on assignments. And I find that even teachers that have been using Classroom for a year, they just didn't even know that that was an option because unfortunately for teachers, they don't see what kids can see. So uh, that is something that's available for students. Now, Sam, do you get into this with your students because you're having them make you know, STEM projects, paper airplanes. Do you assign these projects at all through Classroom or have you considered doing it that way? Um, I use Classroom to distribute information and the beginnings of reflection documents to my students. So they'll do documentation for just about everything. So I might send them... You know, I might set the assignment up with a link and a few questions to kind of get them focused and started, maybe the steps I want them to take. Um, they don't often hit done or submit at the end. We don't close the assignments ever, but I pop into their assignments and I look at where they're at before class starts so I know where the different groups have gotten to. Um, so it's... I treat it very much like an open notebook um, because in my position, I'm not actually grading. So I can do a lot of interaction around the documents without ever having to really worry about that end of it. You know, I, I, I love that there's so many different ways to use these tools. And, you know, every teacher te has a different teaching style. And one of the things that I love is when teachers really, really embrace the idea of walking around their classrooms. How many of you guys are using the, the Google Classroom mobile app? I know that went through a few changes recently, but are you seeing teachers use that as a remote control, per se, for Google Classroom? Are, th are there good reasons to use that in the, in, in, you know, while walking around your class? Well, our teachers um, have iPads, um, and some of our teachers choose to use the the mobile app. Um, I would say that it's not the majority, um, but some of them are very savvy with with the mobile app. Um, I would love to see how some of them are choosing to use that as a remote control. I have not yet uh, really been privy to that, but um, maybe I can get some ideas to pass along to them. So if uh, Share them. I'd love to hear it. We certainly have a lot of comments over on TeacherCast.tv tonight. We're going to try to get to them tonight, uh, mostly around Google Forms. I know some of you guys on the on the panel here are in TeacherCast.tv. You can check out those questions as we go here. A few other quick things here that came out as far as Google Classroom. Um, Using drawings and docs for the classroom, Sam. What what was that all about? You were gonna you were gonna talk about uh, just that when you're creating an assignment to share with your students, sometimes using Google Draw is one that teachers don't think of immediately. But you can, especially if you want students to work with images you've already selected, you can give them a lot of those assets in Google Draw, and you can pile them all around the canvas and make a copy for each student. So while we always aspire to be doing things that are much better than worksheets, if you really want to organize a bunch of preset resources to have them at your student's disposal, Google Draw is an amazing way to do that. Um, even if what you want them to do is make a movie with it, but you want to be able to get all of these media assets to them easily, they can come in through Google Draw that way. It's a lot easier to dump a bunch of images and stuff into Google Draw and share that one file with the entire class than trying to manage actually sharing the real files. I think Google Drawing is one of those applications that most people don't nearly know how valuable it is or how wonderful it is. Sam, you seem to use it an awful lot. Do you find that it has limitations or you know you can only I'm, put I'm sure so many it does things have on limitations, there? Right? Like I think its limitations are its asset where it's got some things that it does really well. And I can build a feature image for a blog post. I can build a slide in there really quickly. I can build a background image for a video. I can build a green screen stand-in image. Um, 
And it's very simple to say, change the background color, drop a picture on top of it, drop two layers of text on top of it, and you're done. Um, so I love that it can do that. And when I found out how draw could be used as a way to like shuttle assets to students, I thought that's phenomenal because I used to have to actually compose blog posts where you would have all of the different pictures you wanted the kids to comment on and use in the blog post. And I'd lay them out in blogger and then the kids would, you know, click on it and copy it over and click on it and copy it over. But if we're on Google draw and they can just open one file and get to work all the better. I mean, imagine this, you take all of the label, all of the keyword labels from an assignment, they're in Google draw. The background of Google draw is a Venn diagram, right? Put the keyword labels in the Venn diagram. You have 30 seconds. You know, stop. Let's see what you did. Oh, I can look exactly at what you did. It's a phenomenal way to speed up some of these seat work activities and just get everybody up on the same page and moving quickly. That's pretty awesome. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Google Drawing. I know they're right now in the middle of redoing it because uh, a while ago I took the Google Drawing form you know, questionnaire form, um, certainly have a wish list of what I hope to see Google Drawings. Is anybody else a Google Drawings fan or? Yeah. Can I add my wish list? Please. please? An iPad app? Why would you say that? Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Is that not, first of all, Google, I, I, I will like all hail the Google Drawing gospel. I love it. But it needs an iPad app. It needs an iPad app. Well, I, I think it'll get there, and I think Forms is due for one soon. I mean, yes. if you've used the new Forms on mobile, it's a lot more responsive and easier to work with than it was the old Forms. Um, drawing is really cool, and I think it'll get there. Uh, my favorite use for drawings is actually to make banners and things like that yeah. for Google Forms and, and whatnot, because it's so easy to get the pixels just right, yeah. and then you can manipulate and do what you need and, and get whatever... Uh, format you want and then the neat thing that i saw that i think is really going to ramp up the creative possibilities is the ability to put a youtube video on google drawing which is which is really sweet and can really do some great things for infographics and things like that we have a uh, charlie here who's in the chat tonight who says he likes to use google drawings to create cartoons which is pretty cool um charlie if you're listening please feel free to throw some links and such in the chat we would love to share with them and it certainly shows that there's a lot of great tools out there that google has and certainly things that teachers wish that they had and you know that kind of reminds me of the teacher that has all of these things given to them by their school district they've got their grade book they've got their trapper keeper they've got all these new things but they really want something more and segueing here really really nicely that's where Kidum comes in. And if you go over to our friends over at Kidum.co, you can see a really nice platform here. Kidum is your classroom away from classroom. It has all of your classes here set up. And if we want, we can click into this 1920s America class here. You can view your class. You can set this up as a grade book. You can see how everything here is really, really great with all the analytics. Everything is broken down here. If I wanted to, I can add an assignment. I can do a lot of different things. I can invite my students. Kidum is a free app that you can do so many things with here. And it is available not only on your desktop, but it is also available for your mobile app. And I know, Alexa, you were just saying you could use a really nice mobile app for your teachers. Kidum is a free mobile app that you can create classes, organize your kids, take lessons on, and uh, do some pretty cool things. So check out kidum.co today one of our sponsors here over on the tech educator podcast going through the last couple minutes here i wanted to kind of open this up and see what tips and tricks do we have here i know we talked a little bit about some of the things that you're seeing teachers do outside of the google apps world but do we have any favorite google classroom hacks that you guys want to uh, bring up or maybe even screenshot and share um this is not mine, and I absolutely will not take credit for this. Um, this is an Alice Keeler um, tip um, that I will 100% give her credit for. Um, I would recommend numbering your assignments. And this would, this I think, really helps for twofold um, organizing your drive. So, I, and what I mean by numbering your assignments, this would be. Um, number 001 or hashtag 001 
um, number 002. So helping for organization standpoint. So when you're looking in your drive, you're able to look in your classroom folder and easily see what assignment it is that you're giving. And also, so when you're talking to your students, if a student's out that day, you don't have to say, oh, go look for the assignment on um, literary terms. You can say to them, in class today, we did assignment number two. And that's, I think, a lot um, easier than having them search for something else. So again, not my idea. That's an Alice Keeler idea, but I think that that's something that's been very helpful. And I've had teachers have a lot of success with that. I love that idea. Uh, trying to get teachers to, like you said, number things, use hashtags, keep things in order is certainly a, a time saver. Um, does anybody else have any other neat tips, tricks, or hacks along? Josh, you got to have something. Your 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 Mr. G's t tips, tricks, and hacks of the day. Uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, the beautiful work of Adam Stillman uh, while well, he was still over at New Visions. Uh, he had created the Doctopus, or at least was part of the group that uh, created the Doctopus add-on slash script in sheets that really did what google classroom does now and a lot of people thought that was going to not get used anymore because google classroom was around but they created a neat little accompanying extension called gubric where you can do rubric grading and attach that to documents or have it emailed from other things uh, so he created a nice little plugin using classrooms api that you can ingest a google classroom assignment and it basically does all of the work that used to take a while to set up in Doctopus. And you can ingest an assignment and then attach your Gubric to it. So it was really kind of a neat feature to, to pull things out of Classroom and add in that functionality and kind of extend the type of assessment and feedback that you can do. That's pretty cool. Sam, is there anything that you like to share about uh, your Classroom experience that might be a little, little different? You know, I'm just a classroom newbie. Like I've been using it for all of two weeks now. And um, yeah, just kind of haven't even tried to figure out any best practices yet. It has so far been transparent and easy enough that I open it when I need it and it does what I need it to do. And then I close it and I don't think about it anymore. Um, you know, maybe at some point in the year, I'll get on top of everything else I'm trying to figure out and I'll figure out how to use classroom better. But until then, it's perfectly functional and we're all good. Very, very cool. Hey, guys, are you seeing anything in the chat uh, to bring up here? I see uh, Charlie's sending some things out here. Peg is is talking away. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, lots of good Alex so Keeler talk. Go ahead. So Jeff, one one other thing that I'll add, um, I'm I'm seeing you know the idea of collaboration. Yes. Um, one thing that I absolutely love about Classroom, it's a, a relatively recent addition, the question feature. Um, the I think that is probably my all time favorite addition to Classroom. Um, I love the idea of that question feature for a couple different reasons. Um, I love it for formative assessments, um, using it for a kind of do now, um, beginning of class. Um, that virtual conversation. And what I found that it does is it gives those quiet students a voice. It gives those students who don't normally raise their hand and it, the ability to um, share what they're feeling. And it has raised the level of classroom discussion um, tenfold. So those students who normally wouldn't add something that they're going to say, if you start off your class by offering that question feature, all of your students get the chance to answer and those students who wouldn't normally have any input um, if they were raising their hand just by speaking, if you're using that question feature, they are able to respond to their, their classmates. Use it for five minutes. Start off every class by using that question feature. And I think that you'll find that the collaboration within your classroom is going to exponentially increase. Um, so it doesn't just need to be used for that quizzing or that um, for the the way that um, you're using it to actually have it as like a um, a grading feature, use it for collaboration, um, and I think that you'll be really surprised at the the response from your students. I, I like what you're saying there a lot. In fact, I just popped it open to look at it. I have a couple questions if you have a second. Yeah. Of um, do you, you've got students can reply to each other and mm -hmm. students can edit answer by default? Reply to each other is on. Yes. And edit yeah. answer is off. Yes, I leave it what? there. Um, okay. I, 
I let them, I, oh, I almost exclusively will let them reply to each other because mm -hmm. again, that idea of the virtual conversation, you get them replying to each other. You get them saying that's the idea of giving those quiet students a voice, um, editing their answer. Um, it, it, it why? Um, yeah. I, I want them to try yeah. to have the idea of formulating the response before they um, actually do that. I don't want them to go back and necessarily change what it is that they're saying, unless you have something that you do. Um, mm -hmm. It really depends on the question that you're asking. And it's, it would, I don't necessarily want them spending a ton of time on this. No, th if and it's that's going my to other be that question. initial can can you open and close this functionality like can i turn this off after five minutes so they don't um, have access to it anymore you could i no. so it's not like a form where you can stop the responses okay because i've used this is compelling to me because in my classes i typically will teach them chatting by using a tool like today's meet and mm -hmm. putting a movie on and running a text chat about the movie while it runs, which is quickly overwhelming for the students, but they learn a lot of strategies really quickly. And I thought it, it's clear that you could do some of that work with this, but if you had an ability to turn it on and off, it would be just an immediate, oh, I'll just use that for this. I'm not sure if I'm there yet. Yeah, I haven't thought about using it to back channel, um, but you could. But I, I have well, used, I've never used the, it. I, I like the idea of running it as a visible text chat front channel for like a warm up question, because yeah. like you said, it's a way of, you know, allowing all of the students to have equal access to that visibility, um, even if they don't necessarily feel like speaking up vocally. Yeah. So the one thing that we haven't discussed yet in ways of using Google Classroom is with our friends the administrators. Josh, do you want to share a couple ideas that you have with working with your uh, supervisors? Sure, yeah. So in Wisconsin, we have something called educator effectiveness. Uh, and basically, it's a, a system of educator evaluation that uh, is statewide. So every school in the state has the same evaluation system, uh, which is uh, nice in some ways. Uh, and, and so it's just reality. It's what we have. Uh, we had a program that was supposed to house all this and it just was not getting the job done. So we ended up um, deciding on some things we could do. How could we facilitate this? Teachers have to create a document called a PPG, professional practice goal. They need to create a document called an SLO or a student learning objective. Uh, and they also need to be able to turn in lesson plans from observations. So kind of floating around without a platform to collect this, naturally Google Classroom came up as an option. And so we worked with the administrators to utilize that and it really simplifies that process for our teachers. I mean, the platform that we used the first year was a huge pain. It required a different login and it didn't even accept uh, Google Docs or links. So you had to download all your files that you needed to turn in as evidence uh, as a PDF and then attach it into these different sections. So it was a pain. Uh, the Google Classroom thing makes it really easy to send reminders and to give feedback. And it's just a really nice way to facilitate that whole process. So our administrators uh, love it. They're using it, I think, pretty much every school. We have six schools in our district. I think every school is using it now. Um, and we've also found some uses for even Doctopus for some different forms as well. So uh, definitely using Google and it's really helping us in a time where we don't have a better platform uh, to do all this stuff with. Jeff, I just want to um, point out that we, we're doing the same thing in Linfield. We have in Massachusetts, we have a similar kind of a thing, um, Josh, where we have a teacher evaluation system across the state. And we had a very similar challenge and struggle where the platform was just really not friendly with Google Apps. And so we are not using Classroom, although I think that's an awesome option that you guys have done, but we are using Google Apps for evidence collection. Teachers have to store all kinds of artifacts. You know, sometimes it's video clips or images or recordings of voice or the, all kinds of different types, you know, scanned documents that kids, you know, write, wrote on or, um, so what's great about Drive is it allows us to store all of that, and we've used a mail merge autocrat to, to distribute those documents that all the teachers have to do. 
And then the administrators have a platform to, you know, write from a spreadsheet can access all of that stuff, which been set to, you know, link viewable, you know, viewability by the link. But what I what I think is so fantastic about either the way we're doing it or the way you're doing it, Josh, is is that as school administrators, whenever we can continue to reinforce and help teachers to make use of a tool that we want them using in the classroom for their learning instead of going through and not only spending money, but having them learn something that has no other purpose but to check a box for the state. I just think it's such a win for teachers. And it's been a huge bump for us in terms of our Google Apps adoption rate because even the teachers that maybe wouldn't have otherwise been using Google Apps are, are kind of forced into it for purposes of evaluation, which is a requirement. But through that process are seeing how wonderful it is and all of the benefits for their classroom. So I just, you know, I just think that the more we can make use of these tools in all of these ways, the more teachers can see the value in their classrooms. Oh, absolutely. That was the first thing I said to both of my principals when they jumped on the bandwagon. I'm like, you know, this is great and all that you're using is going to be efficient. But the biggest thing to me is the modeling that you're doing. And I think that's what goes a long way and why the two buildings that I work in, I think, are further along or at least seem like it than some of the other schools in their adoption and in their innovation. And it starts at the top and the tone that they set. So I totally agree with you. And that's awesome to hear kind of a similar story from a different state. That's a pretty awesome place to stop right there. We've gone through a world of new applications for Google Apps for Education, a lot of new features for Google Classroom. If you have any questions, you can, of course, reach out to us here on the show at TeacherCast or leave us a voicemail. We want to hear from you. TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. And, of course, email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. Um, and also, please take a moment and... Uh, you know, check us out on iTunes. Check us out on YouTube. We just passed over 6,000 YouTube subscribers. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we love it when you reach out and leave comments on the videos. Um, we like to reply to those, and we get a lot of those each week. So thank you so much for that. Uh, let's wrap up where we are. Alexa, where can we find you? What is your Twitter address? At Alexa Schlechter, S-C-H-L-E-C-H-T-E-R. Excellent. And we'll make sure everything is on our show notes. Josh, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me at Mr. G Fact of the Day on Twitter. It's going to be the best spot. Excellent. And uh, Jennifer, where can we find you? Jen's leaving me hanging here again. Jen. You're muted, Jen. I'm talking to my <laughs> muted microphone. <laughs> um, at Jen Judkins, J-E-N-N-J-U-D-K-I-N-S. Sam, where can we find out all about the great paper airplanes that you're making? Head over to mypaperlessclassroom.com. Everything is there. Excellent. <laughs> Check out all the That's great stuff hilarious. happening for all of our co-hosts and more. Want to give one big last uh, shout out to a great project that we're doing here. As I said, we're going to be out in Seattle this weekend for Hack the Classroom. And one of the things that we're going to be launching is the brand new podcast that we're doing with Microsoft Education called the MIE Expert Spotlight Series. You can find it right now by going over to teachercast.net slash MIE Spotlight. We have one episode up right now and we are putting up another episode probably tomorrow so that way we have two episodes up before Hack the Classroom comes up. So check that out today. That's teachercast.net slash MIE Spotlight. Um, on behalf of everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury. We will see you next Tuesday where we're going to be wrapping up everything that happened at Hack the Classroom and be talking about the latest and greatest ed tech in your classrooms. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students. <laughs>